If you become a practicing genetic engineer, at some point you will be asked, is this stuff dangerous? The short, the short answer is, sometimes. There are unquestionably dangerous biological things that can be built. However, it is important to understand the axes of risk and how these emerge. Though pathogenicity represents only one category of concerns, it is a concern that most people have about genetic engineering and thus important to understand. Every bacterium has some essential processes, and most encode three megabases of this information. Some bacteria will be dependent on another organism to supply primary metabolism, and the amount of environmental sensing is variable, but there are some things a cell just needs to have to be a cell. When we deal with pathogenesis, there, there are always additional genes involved. These core processes alone are not sufficient for this behavior. The added genes that are associated with commensal or pathogenic behavior are collectively referred to as virulence factors. In K12 strains of E. coli, there is one important virulence factor called type 1 pili. It is a proteinaceous surface appendage that mediates attachment to the walls of the intestine. It is thus necessary to retain a, a commensal bacterium within the gut and also for pathogenic strains. The sequence of the gene cluster encoding type 1 pili is the FIM cluster, and it's about 12 kb in length, and all the genes are co-located at this specific site in the genome. Thus, it is fairly easy to fully remove this virulence factor. However, it is present in most laboratory strains, including DH10b and DH5-alpha. The appendage encoded by this cluster involves many genes. A few of them regulate the process and control of expression of the various functional components. Ultimately, this pilus is a long polymer that extends from the surface with a mannose binding adhesin on the tip. The tip binds to mannose residues on proteins lining the surface of gut epithelial cells. When you look at micrographs, you see these many appendages extending from the cell surface as hair. Virulence factors operate by diverse mechanisms to address distinguishable concerns. This book, Bacterial Disease Mechanisms, is a great resource for learning more about the various mechanisms that exist. There are six categories of things, adhesion, iron transport, capsular polysaccharides, vacuole modifications, and toxins. The type 1 pili we saw before are an adhesion factor. They enable the organism to adhere to surfaces within the host. There are many other adhesins. They are usually protein, but they have different functional roles. Type 4 pili, for example, retract, allowing the bacteria to pull itself around a surface in a process called twitching motility. We've seen sex pili in previous lectures during descriptions of conjugation. Here, initial adhesion to a recipient cell results in a channel through which a DNA is transferred. Some pili are highly associated with specific types of virulence. For example, the 0157H7 strains often encode bundle-forming pili, and these factors are important to the clinical outcome of infection. There are also many shorter adhesins, including single polypeptide surface appendages like in basin. High affinity iron transport is the mechanism by which bacteria obtain iron during an infection. All organisms sequester free iron both to protect themselves from free radical formation and to avoid pathogens. Iron is absolutely essential for any organism to grow, so pathogenic organisms have evolved exotic mechanisms for taking up iron from sequestered sources. Capsular polysaccharides are present on almost all commensal and pathogenic isolates, but are not present in the modern E. coli lab strains. In the MG1655 micrograph, you see the type 1 pili extending from the surface, but otherwise the outer surface of the cell is the lipopolysaccharide, which is the major lipid component of the outer membrane. Natural isolates from animals and plants will have additional layers of material on their surface. In the enterobacteria, these are put into two different categories, the O antigens and K capsules. Both are carbohydrate polymers that extend from the cell surface, but there's tremendous diversity to the particular sugars present and the amount of it. The difference is that O antigens are anchored to the LPS while K capsules are not. There are various other surface modifications like the non-fimbrial adhesin that might be present on any particular natural isolate. By masking the bacterial surface, capsular polysaccharides protect the cell from antibodies, macrophages and neutrophils, but also phage infections. However, they also tend to interfere with transformation and thus the strains we use in the lab have lost this function. 
MG1655 in particular would be an O16 strain if it had just one more gene, which has been mutated in all the common lab strains. This O antigen would protect the cell from phage infection, but is not typically associated with pathogenesis. These capsular polysaccharides, like the type 1 pili, are encoded by large gene clusters at specific genome loci. If you compare two E. coli strains that make two different O antigens, you will typically find that the cluster is at the same position of the genome in both cases, but the specific sequence of the cluster is very different. K capsules are often quite large. For example, K1 and K5 require 20 KB worth of genes. These clusters become quite large because they typically encode all the nucleotide sugars and sugar transferases needed to build up a complex polymer pattern. When macrophages or neutrophils engulf a bacterium, the bacterium enters a phagocytic vacuole, which is basically just a bleb of the eukaryotic membrane surrounding the bacterium. Some bacteria also encode the ability to invade cells and become engulfed in one of these vesicles. Without further intervention, these vacuoles will fuse with lysosomes and bacteria will be destroyed. Some bacteria encode genes that either interfere with this lysosome fusion or pop the vacuole allowing the bacterium to freely move about the cytoplasm. The most commonly cited examples are Listeria, Shigella, and Salmonella, but is a fairly common virulence mechanism for bacterial pathogens. Finally, we have toxins. There are some toxins present on all bacteria. For example, all the enterobacteria have an outer membrane component called lipid A, which is the lipid portion of the lipopolysaccharide molecule, which is also called endotoxin. If you inject a significant amount of purified lipid A into a mammal, there is a strong response called sepsis that at high doses can lead to organ failure and death. More generally, endotoxin is one of several pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. These chemical moieties are identified by the innate immune system and are a primary line of defense from infection. The lipid A is the most potent of these. The outer membrane protein lipoprotein is also a strong agonist of the immune system. Since bacteria don't do CPG methylation like eukaryotes, the unmodified DNA is also used by the innate immune system to detect bacteria. Also, the presence of formal methionine on N-terminal peptides is another PAMP. Then there is another category of toxins which, is, which are more active in their effects. You've probably heard of some of these. Shiga toxin comes from Shigella. Botulinum toxin is responsible for botulism and also for Botox treatments. Hemolysin is a widely distributed functionality that causes red blood cells to lyse, spilling heme into the bloodstream for consumption by microbes. The E. coli lab strains, like all bacteria, have many PAMPs. However, they do not encode any of these toxins, and it is atypical to insert toxin genes into E. coli in biotechnology applications.